What is up, sports fans, and welcome back to another episode of the NFL Whip Around. For those watching live on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. We want to bring you all the best sports news right here at Fans First Sports Network. And if you're listening to this on the audio platform, especially Apple Podcasts and Spotify, give us a five star ring. It does help, believe it or not, in the algorithms. But I'm Jeff Hartman. Joined by me always is Coach KT Smith. What's up, Coach? How's it going? Doing great. Doing great. Hope everybody's gearing up for uh, a good holiday weekend and uh, maybe doing some traveling. I'm going to get away for a little bit. I'm, I'm excited hey. for it. Yeah, we're recording this a little bit earlier than we usually do. But nonetheless, the news we're going to talk about is still pertinent in terms of the National Football League and everything that made waves. And this actually happened right after we recorded. I think it was the day after we recorded last week. And you even texted me and said, oh, man, if I would have known this, I would have gone off during the show. And that is about the NFL's decision to ban the hip drop tackle, whatever that is, whatever that's being called today. Coach, I'm sure you have some strong opinions about this. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I struggle with this one. I I struggle with uh, with how specifically this is going to be enforced. One, because it's yep. really subjective. It's really subjective. What is the definition of a hip drop tackle? Does that mean that as a, in the process of tackling somebody, my hips drop to the ground? Because that's 75 percent of the tackles that occur in the NFL. Uh, one of the most one of the most fundamental coaching points that I've been teaching for decades to young football players is when you're tackling, as you're going to the ground, you try to anchor your hips to the ground. What that means is, man, you're you're doing the best that you can to bring your leverage to the ground so that you obviously can bring that that individual down with you. You want to work a, a tight clamp and anchor your hips to the ground. And that's how you get a guy on the ground. Uh, there's the only, I mean, can that be dangerous? It could be dangerous if in the process of doing that, you happen to land on the back of a guy's legs, roll his ankle, he gets his knee caught, something along those lines. That's, I understand that. Uh, there have been a couple of high profile examples where those types of injuries have occurred and they've been traced right back to a guy bringing the, you know, his body weight down on the lower half of somebody uh, of a, of a ball carrier. I get it, but how are you supposed to tackle in the NFL? How are you supposed to tackle? You can't hit high. You can't hit too low. You can't hit a guy at the knees. You can't hit a guy who's quote unquote defenseless. Cause I don't still don't know what that is. There's a million different rules on the quarterback. I just don't know how you legislate this from an officiating standpoint and maintain the integrity of the game. Yeah. Maybe, you and know, I don't, I don't No, I have a lot of questions about this and, and everyone's going to, complain about how it's going to be i'm sure there's going to be a lot of fines handed out maybe not flags immediately but there'll be a lot of fines levied I, I have a question as it pertains to how this is going to look and will it actually impact the result the meanings points being scored so i go back and i've said this on multiple podcasts and i'll say it again here i go back to the the poster child video of why this is the way that it is. And that is Mark Andrews being tackled by Logan Wilson on primetime Bengals Ravens in Baltimore. That's the play where Mark Andrews got hurt. So now I say, I want to go back and ask myself this question. What is Logan Wilson supposed to do there? They're near the goal line coach. What's he supposed to do? Let him score, jump on his back and be carried. Mark Andrews is huge. Okay. He's going to carry dudes into the end zone. I just don't understand if a player is in trail position outside of diving for their feet and trying to basically sweep their legs, in which case he's going to fall forward anyways. What are you supposed to do to try and stop that person's inertia from moving forward? And the answer is nothing. You can do nothing. So if you're a coach, what are you telling your defenders to do? I, I don't know. That's a good, that's a great question. I don't know. Because you you know you brought up a key point. If you're in trail position, the overwhelming majority of tackles get made without a defender in optimal position. Everybody begins their season by teaching perfect form tackling, and what they do is they line up the tackler in a perfect position, squared up against the ball carrier, and they teach you how to make a perfect form tackle. Well, I could probably count on one hand the number of perfect form tackles I saw uh, in whether it was high school, college, or the pros last year, it, it's not realistic at full speed. So guys are being forced to tackle, to use a quarterback phrase, off-platform, meaning when you're not 
in optimum position. So you're right. What do you do in, in that situation? I, if you just wrap without anchoring your hips to the ground, Mark Andrews drags you into the end zone. <laughs> yeah. If you jump on his back, you look like a fool. And then, <laughs> and then everybody's going to bang you for like the, yeah. for, like, for terrible form. Oh, these guys don't know how to tackle anymore. Well, of course they don't know how to tackle because, because how do you tackle under the new rules? It, it really is. It, I, and then, and then throw, throw this in, but now the NFL has, has also, Pass this rule that's going to allow the replay room to intervene to make uh, overall potential judgment calls. Well, how many stoppages are we going to get during a game? Well, you know, you go back. Oh, was that a hip drop tackle? Let's stop the whole game for three minutes while they try to decide if his yeah. hips were anchored to the ground. It, I don't know, man. I, I get it. Every, everybody's trying to make the game safer, but to me, this is just over officious. If they, if they were to say the National Football League, okay, here's what we're doing. We're, we're banning this style of tackling, but here's what we're also going to do. We've worked with the NFLPA, and we are going to allow coaches to have more practice time tackling to get their players more acclimated and ready. Then I'd say, okay, at least they're giving them that. But you're right. They don't know how to tackle, and that's because they also can't practice it. The NFLPA has been so adamant of less practice time, less hitting, less tackling because of safety purposes. And I understand that they're representing the players, but it's, it's that almost is decreasing the product as much, as much as the rules. Would you agree or disagree? No, hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and then, and then throw into it the fact that uh, a lot of guys come out of college defensive backs in particular, not real enthusiastic about tackling to start with because they just don't say that's not, that's not how they make their money, man. You know, yeah. you, you're a shutdown corner. Uh, you, that's how you make your money. And, and so the product is going to get worse, lack of practice time, too many rules, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and there's going to be people out there that say, well, Hey, you know, d trail position, don't be in trail position. Yeah. That's easier said than done. The game of football is a fluid game. And sometimes you are in trail position. Maybe I think about all these times where you see Cam Hayward hustling down the field, 30 years, 30 yards downfield. He's got to think about how he's going to approach the tackle at this point. It's weird. And we'll see if it's actually strictly enforced or if it's just kind of one of those where they're putting it out there to say that, Hey, we're going to try and make the game safer. We shall see. But ultimately, Hey, by the way, we talked about this last week. Speaking of rule changes, what do you think about the kickoff? Uh, we talked about the changes, but it was uh, approved and the kickoff being brought back into the game this year. Well, uh, I'm, you know, I'm open to it. I, I, I'm curious to see how it goes. I watched a little bit of the XFL. I, I say, I, you know, it was a little bit of a muddle with all the bodies so close together, but it will, one, one thing I'm a big fan of is giving up or giving coaches opportunities to, to come up with new schemes, new ideas, new ways uh, to try to, in this instance, right, uh, scheme the kickoff. They're going to have to get creative. The Steelers go out and sign Cordaro Patterson because, one, he can help him as a running back, but, two, he is one of the most prolific kickoff returners in the history of the league. you got to bet that they're hard at work right now scheming up some stuff to try to, to shake him loose. So from that perspective, it should be kind of interesting. I mean, the NFL is a copycat league. Uh, last year, I was just reading an article about how everybody in the NFL last year copied Miami's uh, exit motion or their so-called escape motion, which was a, a new wrinkle on a, on a, a, like the, the old jet motion that Mike McDaniel came up with. And all of a sudden, everybody jumped on it. It'll be fascinating to see what happens the first time somebody runs a kickoff back for a touchdown. Now, all of a sudden, does everybody dive in on that scheme? So it'll make it, it'll make it more interesting than watching the kicker boot one into the, into the stands. If they were going to keep that up, I was always going to say, like, just don't even have a kickoff. Just give them the ball at the 25. To just spot it there and then start your play. But, hey, it's okay. Now let's talk about something else the league decided, which a lot of people aren't crazy about, especially the National Basketball Association, which the NBA always owned Christmas Day. They would always have the Lakers on in the afternoon, evening, the NBA on Christmas Day. The NFL said not so much, not anymore. They are going to have two games, a doubleheader on Christmas Day, which is on a Wednesday. And the week prior, those teams are going to play on Saturday. So it's going to be a very similar Sunday to Thursday week. Let's first, let's not talk about the work week yet. Let's talk about your thoughts on the Steelers. Uh, not the Steelers. I hope not the Steelers. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk about, I have no inside information, by the way. Let's talk about the, the doubleheader itself first before we talk about the lead up and the, the week prior to. What's your, what are your thoughts on the Christmas Day games? Well, 
first of all, if you're the NBA, shut up. Yeah, shut up, right? I mean, like, <laughs> you don't own Christmas Day. And the NBA's regular season product stinks. It stinks. Yeah. NBA midseason basketball is awful. So, you know, create a better product and, and then maybe the ratings will be better. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but can you ever remember there being a Wednesday game in the history of the NFL? Is this going to be the first ever Wednesday football? No, I believe that in 2020, uh, the Steelers and the Ravens game that was scheduled for Thanksgiving was bumped back so many times. I want to say they played that game on a Wednesday. It was like, if okay. you remember, it was like 4.30 p.m. Huh. And if you, <laughs> it, was, it was odd. It was either Tuesday or Wednesday when they played. It was in the middle of the week, though. I do remember that. So that's interesting. I like that they're taking into account the fact that uh, that Wednesday literally in the middle of the week is going to have to create some scheduling issues for the teams that do play. So they're going to give them the prior Saturday to play. Um, I feel as though the NFL is running a bit of a risk of oversaturating the market. You're now going to have games on just about every day of the week, but at the same time, they're so popular. Christmas day ratings have been through the roof. It seems like the public wants more than less. So I think this is a smart move. Everyone always says that, and I've said it too. Oh, there's a threat of oversaturating the market. Man, people kill for football. They don't care. They'll watch it every day of the week no matter what. So if the NFL is going to base their decisions off ratings, they can do no wrong because the ratings are always going to be good. Then And now when you have these games that are specifically on streaming services, which, again, they're doing it, they're – Wild card game only on Amazon Prime, which I'm okay with because I have it. My wife keeps Amazon in business single handedly, but still, it's one of those situations where I hate that people have to pay extra to watch a playoff game. But this, the NFL is going to do this, they don't care. This is a business. People that talk about like it's not right for the game and they speak the, about the game as if it's some you know, this beautiful thing. And it's, it's almost like if you're reading a novel, no, that's not football. It's a business. It's a billion dollar industry and their job is to make money. And they're going to make a lot of money off of these Christmas day games. Do I like it? Hell no. I don't like it. I have five small kids. Okay. I have 15 and under Christmas day is like the one day. And I always do this when the schedule comes out, I say, please Lord, don't have the Steelers play on any holidays because it, it throws it off because I have to work. Like, it's not just a, holiday then i have to work during that time and it's frustrating and the kids don't necessarily understand it they do a little bit now i don't like those games for the steelers i'll watch those games but for the steelers i, I really hope they don't play on christmas do you think though because of the the setup in the saturday prior being very similar to a sunday to thursday do you think the competitive balance is still going to be there or do you think that's skewed as well as well i've never thought that the thursday products are very good yeah, because of the lack of preparation. But uh, Christmas Day is also special. So and, and I'm sure that they're going to schedule some marquee teams. A lot of times on those Thursday night games, you don't you don't get the best matchups or the best teams playing. Uh, so so I think given the circumstances and the fact that we're now on Christmas Day coming to the end, I'm sure there'll be playoff implications, et cetera. Uh, I suspect you're going to get a good game or good games. Yeah, hopefully. All right, let's go to our next topic. The Philadelphia Eagles announced on Friday that they are trading pass rusher Hassan Reddick to the New York Jets for a conditional third round pick that could become a second rounder based on production. Are you surprised that Reddick, who will be 30 when next season starts, that he commanded a much higher trade return than quarterbacks like Kenny Pickett, Justin Fields, and even Desmond Ritter? Uh, you could throw in Sam Howell there as well if you'd like all of whom are at least five years younger than Reddick and play the game's most important position. What are your thoughts on that trade, sending that capital to the New York Jets? Yeah. I mean, some people are actually saying that they feel like the Jets got the better part of that deal, that that they that Reddick's price tag could have been a lot higher. Uh, I think it's – I got two thoughts on that. One, it, it certainly is doesn't speak – uh, it, it, it indicates that the league doesn't think very highly of those quarterbacks. The, the, the draft compensation being so low for those guys, uh, we've talked about this before, is very surprising. But then again, you see a 30-year-old guy like Reddick. Yeah, now, Reddick can still play. He, he, he had 10 and a half sacks last season. He's made the Pro Bowl the last two years. Um, he, he's a guy who can still play. But at age 30, I think that uh, when you give up high draft picks, you would like to think that you're going to get a guy who's going to be there for a few years or be at least highly productive 
for a few years. Whether that's true of Reddick, we'll see. But it certainly suggests that the value for a 30-year-old edge rusher is significantly higher than it is for any of those QBs. And that is really stunning when you think about you know, where those guys were just a couple of years ago. The other thing real quick, I think, is this. It certainly indicates that the Jets feel like they can win now. I mean, they're giving up a potential second round draft pick for a 30 year old edge rusher. You don't do that unless you feel as though you've got a team ready to compete for a championship. So obviously with Rodgers coming back, they they feel that way. Man, I, I go back to you, everyone out, outside of Justin Fields that he, we named in these trades came from the 2022 NFL draft class, the, the quarterback class. And I still remember watching some draft coverage and I'm not a draft, Nick. I do not. I'm not all about the NFL draft. I don't even know the college players too well until the football, the NFL season ends. And so I remember people like Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL network saying, hey, this is probably one of the worst classes that we've had of quarterbacks. And I, man, the Steelers needed a quarterback. That sucks. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's a situation where you're like, damn, it didn't, it didn't that come to fruition. It, it, it did come to fruition. And you forget about people like Matt Corral, who also in that class or Malik Willis, who was in that class, who's stuck in the depth chart behind, well, now Will Levis down in Tennessee and Mason Rudolph is down there now as well. I think that Hassan Reddick is a proven commodity. Whereas who of those quarterbacks is a proven commodity? Maybe Justin Fields, maybe look at his stat line. It's very inconsistent. He's more consistent as a runner than he is a thrower. So I think what this comes down to is the are the players that are viewed and deemed as a proven commodity. And the way you just described Hassan Reddick, back to back Pro Bowl seasons, ten and a half sacks last year. I think he's a proven commodity. And so I don't know. Do you know what the what what are those uh, milestones that would have to be crossed for it to turn a second second rounder? Do you know that? Sixty. He's got to play sixty plus percent of the snaps or. Uh, I don't know if it's and or if it's or uh, get ten sacks. So I mean that's a that's a that's a reachable bar for him. For Hell sure. yeah, that's a reachable. That, that that's why Philly sent him up there because yeah. shoot, we can get a second round pick out of this guy. And if the Jets suck, that could be a decent second round pick. So I don't know. They, we talked about this last week. Trades are goofy. <laughs> the trades that we've seen are absolutely goofy. When you even look at Legarius Sneed going to Tennessee, now he got paid. They did yep. a new deal with him. He got paid. Yep. So Hassan Reddick, he has one year left on his deal. So this is literally for a one year rental, correct? Correct. Yep. It's crazy. That is crazy. Well, this is a good segue talking about the quarterbacks into our fourth topic. Speaking of quarterbacks, a recent study by the athletic determined that of the 28 quarterbacks drafted in the top 10 between 2011 and 2023, 41% turned out to be bus or career backups with four quarterbacks likely to go in the top 10 in this year's draft. The study suggests one or two of them will fall short of expectations. So among the four, Caleb Williams, Drake may Jaden Daniels and JJ McCarthy, who do you think is most likely to not pan out? First of all, wouldn't that scare you if you were a GM, <laughs> you read that study and you go, Oh, well, uh, there's some, there's some caveats here, coach. Like, that's in the top 10. So that's a top 10 pick. So Justin Fields was selected 11th overall. He doesn't fall into this category. Right. Kenny Pickett was a 20th overall pick. He doesn't fall into this category either. These are top 10 picks. That's insane to me that this percentage of them falls into the bust category, which by the way, did they even go into what is deemed a bust or a career, you know, career backup is in and of itself is fine. What do they deem as a bust? Just someone that doesn't stick with the team. Yeah, they had a whole series of of uh, okay. metrics that they used. I mean, like like the example they used for career backup was like a Marcus Mariota, who I think went at number yeah. two. And um, and again, if you th if you if you pick your quarterback at number two, you expect his career to turn out better than Marcus Mariota's. You just right. do. No disrespect to Marcus Mariota, but that's not you know you get a, a third round guy. If Marcus Mariota had been a third round guy, I don't think anybody would be complaining. But they look at him as two overall, and they say. You know, that's uh, he's, he, he didn't live up to expectations. Well, look at look at Jameis Winston. Wasn't he a first overall pick? Yes. Yes. And he, he's now a career backup. Yeah, for sure. That's, so go so, ahead. I, we'll, so, so to get to those to get to the cries in the current draft, um, I'm not sold on Caleb Williams. I I'm not saying that he's going to be a bust, but I certainly wouldn't write his name down in Sharpie uh, as a <laughs> as the guy, you know, 
who, who I would say, all right, this, this guy's a, a surefire, you know, star. I just think that there's too many extenuating circumstances. His play looks great, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that comes with him that I am nervous about if I were the bears. Right. So, so he's a guy that I, you know, I, I and then the other guy that I, that I have a few questions about is Drake may because of his mentality. I mean, he is a Brett Favre type quarterback where he, where he believes like he can make every play and, and maybe he, you know, sometimes he can, but sometimes he can't, I think he's going to have to be managed really well. You're going to have to be able to protect him. Like the Texans protected CJ Stroud. They did a great job of minimizing risk of, of max protecting, of giving him things that he could be successful with. And then as he saw some success, then they, then they expanded things. If, if Drake may gets into a system where they, they kind of give him free reign or they throw everything at him at once, I think that he could, he could struggle. So, so for me, I mean, McCarthy, I really believe is the safest bet. He might not have the highest ceiling, but I think he's the safest bet to be, to be like a Kirk cousins, a guy who's going to have a really good NFL career, maybe not superstar career, but you can, you know, you can win with him. So that that's interesting. Let's let's see if you can do this off the top of your head. Let's try to do an NFL current NFL comparison for these four guys. So you said JJ McCarthy is Kirk Cousins, yes? It, it really reminds me of, yes. Sure. Okay. What about uh, let's go to Caleb Williams. Is there anyone in the NFL right now that you would say that's my NFL comp for Caleb Williams? Well, I his, in in a perfect world, his ceiling is is Patrick Mahomes. He does those Patrick Mahomes type things. But he could also be Jameis Winston. You know, he could also be a guy whose quirky personality and kind of off-field issues wind up making, you know, or compromising his play in some ways. What about Jaden Daniels? Jaden Daniels is hard. He's a hard one to draw a comp for because, uh, you know, he just – he's so slight. He's got the – he's six foot four and he's only 210 pounds. And I, I don't think 210 is accurate. Um, he needs to put on some muscle. And he's got this elusive, you know who he reminds me of from way back in the day? He reminds me of with his big arm and his elusiveness, uh, you know, and his build like a Randall Cunningham. Uh, yeah, but I mean, obviously Randall Cunningham. Yeah, he ne- but Randall Cunningham never played in, an, a, you know, th- this type of a modern NFL yeah. system. Um, and then Drake May to me, again, he could be, he could be a Josh Allen uh, type guy. I, I think that with his, with his build and his athleticism and his big arm, my God, he's got an amazing arm, you know, like if he, if at the, at the, at the top of his game, he could be a Josh Allen. Um, but you know, he could also be a guy who just turns it over way too much and, and, and get you in, into, uh, an awful lot of trouble. He could be Brett Favre in Atlanta. So, you know, I, I, you know, that's off the top of my head. Don't hold that's me. That's fine. This. <laughs> do you think all do you think all four of those guys will fall into the category of a top 10 pick? I mean, the odds just say no. The odds say no. The odds say when's the last time we had a quarterback class where the top four guys all turned out to be, you know, really good with the team who drafted them? I, I don't know the answer well, to that, but you'd have to go back a ways. Not just that. Do you think all four of those players are selected in the top 10 in this upcoming draft? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Because J.J. McCarthy, has, he's kind of the wild card for me. There's people that think he could slide to 11, 12. Uh, it, most of the other three are all top 10 guys. J.J. McCarthy is the one guy that it just depends on who you talk to. But it's interesting. It's really interesting as to see how that goes. Let's. I'm really anxious to talk with you about this fifth topic here. And that is that the New England Patriots, the dynasty, which is a documentary which is being done. I don't know if it's by Netflix or who is doing it, but... Boy, there's been a lot of talk, and there's been a lot of people that have been, this is this is BS. This is not a painting an accurate picture of the Patriots. I've seen a lot of stuff about Aaron Hernandez and his time with the team. Nonetheless, Bill Belichick is set to write a book that allegedly will counter the portrayal of him presented by Apple TV in the recent docuseries on the Patriots dynasty. On a scale of 1 to 10, what's your level of interest in this <laughs> New England Patriots Belichick drama? I don't have Apple TV. I wish I did. I don't either. I would, love, I would love to watch it. I would love to watch it. I, I'm kind of fascinated by it. I'll, I'll admit. Um, first of all, <laughs> as Steeler fans, you and I both suffered a lot of heartbreak at the hands yes. of the Bill Belichick Patriots. 
And so uh, anything that disparages them is fine by me. (laughs) 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 Um, That's terrible to say, but, uh, but I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm the the amount of Patriot players who have rushed to Belichick's defense has been interesting because by all accounts, this, this documentary does suggest that he was uh, cold and uncaring and treated players like pieces of meat. You know, you were, you were valuable if you were functional, but if you weren't, you were just discarded. And yeah, uh, it just, and, and I'll be interested to see what, what Belichick's rebuttal is. Belichick doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who feels the need to defend himself. He's been, you know, unapologetic his entire professional career. So I wonder if, if, if his rebuttal will be more of uh, just that an actual counter argument to what the documentary presented, or will it be like, Hey, my life in coaching is it, is it just going to be kind of a retrospective? So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm in. I'm curious. I, I'm very curious. Uh, so let's talk about some of the dynasties in National Football League history. You could go all the way back to the Green Bay Packers, really early on, pre-merger. Uh, you could talk about the Steelers of the '70s. Most would say the 49ers of what would you say the 49ers of the '80s, early '90s? Yep. Dallas Cowboys in the '90s. And then obviously the Patriots of the 2000s out of those dynasties was any dynasty marred in more controversy than those Patriot teams. No, no, not at all. Not at all. That, but yeah, but also no dynasty lasted as long. Right. I mean, the, the, the Cowboys, that was a four or five year window, right? Yeah, the, the Steelers of the seventies that they won four and six years. Six years, true, but look at the Patriots, man. This thing lasted 15, 18 years. They won their first one in 2001, and they won their sixth in what, 2016, 17? Yeah, I guess right you're right now that I think about it, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that that time, that thing lasted forever. So, so they certainly had plenty of time to build up a lot right. of dirt, but what some of the stuff they built up is unprecedented. Some of the yeah. stuff they built up was at the beginning of the damn dynasty. That is when true. When they also. <laughs> Spygate... It was in 2004, was it? Four, no. think, yeah. yeah, 2004, the AFC Championship game in Pittsburgh, Heinz Field, uh, where they supposedly spied on the Steelers and took the notes. And I've always said this. I will take this to the, to the day I die. I will say this. If it wasn't that big of a deal, why did the NFL destroy the tapes? That's all I want to know. Why did the NFL destroy the tapes if it was so okay? Because that Patriot fans will say that. They'll say, that's nothing. It was nothing, nothing that no team that every team doesn't do. Then why did they destroy the tapes? That's what I want to know. So that stuff sticks with me, and I want to see this thing, and I want to see, hey, drag them through the mud, like drag them through the damn mud. I want to see them tarnished. I'm fine with it. I'm sour. I'm bitter. <laughs> I'm angry still. I'm a Steelers <laughs> fan. If it weren't for that damn dynasty, the Steelers would probably have two more Super Bowl rings uh, to their name. And yes, I am. I am very, very cold and bitter about that. <laughs> Uh, you feel it too don't lie i do man i'm not gonna (laughs) lie i do i do all right do we have a player profile this week can you think of someone to talk about something i guess i should say well i i don't you know i always like to give shout outs to uh, all the south jersey guys that come on here that's my homerism and so we we mentioned hassan reddick uh south jersey guy had in heights high school my mom's alma mater he went to the same high school my mother did and, uh, you know, I mean, good for him, man. He's going to he's going to get get, you know, uh, an opportunity to uh, showcase himself again and maybe maybe get one more contract in the league. He's made a, you know, awesome career for himself uh, coming out of Haddon Heights and then to Temple. I mean, that's not a, a giant football powerhouse, but they've turned out some pretty good defensive players there. So he's put together a really kind of under the radar, but but excellent career on his third team now. Yeah, it's pretty crazy to think about it. And I remember him coming out of Temple, and he was a guy that a lot of Steeler fans liked. His ability to play multiple positions, he can kind of flex inside if you need him to as well. Very talented guy, very athletic. Good for him. He'll probably, hopefully, has a good year, and he gets one more final paycheck. It's a three-year deal or something like that, and that's it. That's it. So good for him. So, Coach, you are traveling this week, or do we have a call sheet uh, topic, or what? Are you taking the week off? Uh, I'm going to try to do a little on location. Uh, nice. Sheet, uh, take it on the road with me. So I don't have anything finalized just yet, but stay okay. tuned for that. We're, we'll see what we uh, what we come up with right now. It's going to be a, a, a road show uh, no matter what. 
There you go. And I will tell everyone out there that's listening to this, if you haven't, go to Fans First Sports Network. You can check out some of the quarterback breakdowns that Coach is doing, very short in length. It's kind of like a one-play breakdown of the quarterbacks. Just did Drake May, which I think landed from Friday morning of our YouTube channel, so go check that out. Uh, and you can also check out his work with the Steel Curtain Network, Pittsburgh Steelers coverage both on YouTube and anywhere you get your podcast. Check him out. But, Coach, thank you for your time. As always, have a safe trip, and we will talk next week. Take it easy.